trip over it. So I'm glad you guys are here today. Um, this is the second time that I've been able to come and present at UCAP, and, and the first time I came, I left completely energized, uh, feeling so grateful that there are so many people who are willing to come and spend their time and their resources and their energy trying to get inside the fight that we're in. When, when we're out in the outskirts, I'm a marriage and family therapist, I frequently feel kind of alone. I feel like I'm fighting an uphill battle sometimes. It feels like I don't have any other support, and coming to a, a place like this is actually really re-energizing for me and helps me see that we're, we're doing some good in the world and we're, we're moving forward. There's far more people here today than there was even two years ago in that main room. So before I get started, I just wanted to throw a quick shout out to several other people who have helped with this presentation. My brother-in-law and one of my best friends, Chase, is here today. Everything you see in the presentation itself, Chase has had an influence in it. And he's put in a lot of work, and you'll see a lot of artwork, and you'll see a lot of stuff that goes along with what I'm presenting, and he'll add a lot of richness to this. So anything you like in the presentation is Chase's, and anything you don't like is probably stuff that I, is, that I in, included. All right? I'm also grateful to have my family here today. It brings my numbers up for the presentation. So I've got like 15 more people than I normally would. So that helps me with my statistics. But I'm grateful to, that they're here. It's, it's nice to have that support. I'm grateful for my wife. She has been helping me with my own nervousness over presenting at this. I present at places all the time. And every time I give a presentation, I still almost have a panic attack right before I get started. And so my wife is there to just talk me down and help me kind of do everything that I teach everyone else in my office to do every day to day. So the topic today is on shame resiliency. And to get started, I want you to do something and just think for a minute about something in your own life. And focus on what's the thing in your life that people don't know? What's the thing that the fewest people in your life know? Maybe it's your biggest struggle. Maybe it's a secret that you keep. Maybe it's something that you think you may take with you to your grave. And as you think about this thing, pay attention to what your body starts to do. Notice what happens in your head and in your cheek muscles, down through your neck, your shoulders, your chest. Just pay attention to your physiology. As you think about your own secret, listen to the lyrics of this song and watch the video and see if there's any parallel or connection that you can draw. When the days are cold and the cards all fold and the saints we see are all made of gold When your dreams all fail and the wounds we hail are the worst of all and the bloods run stale I wanna hide the truth, I wanna shelter you Come. 
How many of you are feeling heavy? You can raise your hands here, it's okay, like you're in a safe place. All right. How many of you are feeling some tightness in your chest? How many of you can't seem to get that thing of your own outside of your head right now? Okay. That's kind of what I'm going for. I don't want you to stay there all day, but I want you to, to be in touch emotionally with what the experience of shame is. Shame is this thing that sucks us into a tunnel and makes us very self-absorbed in a really negative way and prevents us from being able to live a healthy, happy life. Renee Brown, who is probably the most popular person on the topic of shame in the world right now, defines shame as the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Something we've experienced, done, or failed to do makes us unworthy of connection. I like Carl Jung's definition of shame. That shame is a soul-eating emotion. That's what it feels like to me. Simply, shame feeds on itself. Shame survives in the darkest recesses of one's insecure, self-loathing, and self-doubting mind. Shame needs negativity and fear to survive. So when you come to a conference like this, most of the time people are coming because there's some thought about the idea of addiction or pornography addiction or sexual addiction. With almost any addiction, it's really easy to see the thorns. And the thorns are the behaviors that get us into trouble. So if I'm a substance user, it's pretty easy for people to see my life unravel as I use the substance. But with leaders or with professionals or as family members of someone who you love, if you know somebody who has an addiction, if you attack only the thorns, you miss on what's actually really important. And the roots of addiction are shame. Behind every single addiction, it funnels down into a mismanagement of an emotion to the point that shame is operating my life. So today we're going to talk a little bit about what shame is, how it affects our lives, and then hopefully spend the majority of our time moving into how to be resilient to shame. So shame operates in a cycle, and it, and it, and it feeds off of three kind of main beliefs. The first belief is a message that we feed to ourselves or that the world feeds to us or that our life experiences give to us that says, I am basically blank. And you can fill in your own blank. I am unworthy, I'm unlovable, I'm inadequate, I'm a failure, that's mine. This image here is a, is a line drawing of Chase. Chase actually gave a TED talk down in Florida. And during his TED talk, he had like this stage fright thing happen where he froze up. I've got permission from him to share this, by the way. So, and, and he froze up, and this is a picture that he screenshot from that talk where he said he was in the deepest moment of his shame, where everything went silent, and he's there trying to figure out what to say, and then the, the TED talk pans away to the crowd, and people in the crowd are like cringing. They're like, oh, poor guy, like, you know. Like, and so Chase gave me permission to, to show this with this idea that in that moment, all of those demons come back and say, I'm not good enough. And when we operate from a place in the back of our mind that always feels like we're not good enough, it leads us to have to figure out how to survive in life because we are so afraid that if people see our ugliness, they won't love us. And so we get busy scrambling, try to perform in ways that people will accept us because our biggest fear as human beings is that we'll, get, we'll be rejected. We are wired to be social, connected human beings, and now we feel that something's not right with us, and if people really see us, they won't want us, and so we put on the mask. And the mask can look all sorts of different ways. Sometimes it's anger. We keep people at a distance through anger. Most of the time, it could be through some type of overcompensation. I become a workaholic, or I become the most spiritual guy at my church or I become the world's happiest dad, even though on the inside I'm feeling empty and hollow and shallow. And ultimately, this is where we start with an addiction. We start to split into what we call the Jekyll Hyde experience, 
where on the outside I look one way, people will come to me and say, Tyler, like you're the hardest working person I know. And if, if I'm not in touch with my own shame the way I need to be, then I hear them, and what do I hear on the inside? If you only knew. Like you do not even know the half of it. Yeah, I work harder than just about anybody I know, but how often do my kids get to see me? And all I hear is that I'm still a failure as a father or as a husband. Right? Because I'm performing, trying to get people to say that I'm good. And I'm setting up the measuring stick now. I'm giving the measuring stick of my value to other people. And that's a dangerous thing because we can never actually achieve pleasing everybody else. This leads to a feeling of isolation. And sometimes that isolation is social. We put on a happy face, but we feel like we're on an island on the inside and nobody really understands us. We start to create our own prison walls with the way that we interact with other people, where we only give them just enough to try to get some level of connection, and yet we never actually get real connection and we feel alone. And now we're stuck. We're stuck in this dark tunnel. There's nowhere to go. We can't actually reach out to other people because we don't trust them. We don't trust that they'll be able to hold whatever story we're going to give them. But now we're in a lot of pain and we've got to figure out how to survive life. And that's where we turn to acting out with all forms, whether it's pornography or substances or food. My current situation is the, the hot lamp food in the gas stations of all places. Like it's a pretty low place to go, right? You know, but if I have like a really, really like stressful day, for some reason Maverick is like this like glow, you know, it's like you just can't get out of there. So it's the same process emotionally. And what happens is, is that I'm feeling like a failure. I've got to cope with it because I don't want to go home and tell my wife I feel like I'm a failure or have my kids see it, but I'm still in pain and I've got to go somewhere to try to fill the void. And so I can do it in a very self-serving, consistent way that gives me just a tiny bit of relief in that moment. It almost feels like it works for the time being, right? But every one of those behaviors is something that actually ruins my life, and I feel bad about it. So I actually, when I feel bad about that behavior, that's not a, that's not a bad thing. Guilt is a good thing. Guilt's a motivator. It says, you know what, you need to change something. Something's a little bit off. But instead, when I already have the template set in my head, it turns into toxic shame. So now everything I do to act out becomes proof that I'm no good, and it begins this spiral down into the depths, and then we look up out of this dark hole and we go, how did I get here? I never would have thought I could have done blank. And now I feel totally stuck. And shame loves secrecy. We stay alone. So we're going to talk about how shame develops and how it operates in our world for just a minute. If you, I, I, use this, I use this analogy with my clients sometimes, that if you think about how cancer works, cancer basically goes into the body, and then it, it works against itself, and it attaches to other cells, and then it continues to consume until it eventually consumes and kills, right? Shame is the emotional equivalent of cancer. When it starts to operate inside of us, it starts to shut down all of our systems. It pulls us away from connection with ourselves and with other people and with our higher power. And it leaves us feeling totally alone and consumed. So shame starts from the very beginning. And we live in a world that we can't avoid it. A lot of times my clients come in and they say, well, I got rid of my shame, I'm good. I'm like, okay, good. There's going to be something in the next week, I promise you, that will hit that nerve again. And what happens, because we're human beings wired for attachment and connection, and we need that with other people, we have to interact with other people who are also not perfect. And in those interactions with other people, there's a question that every one of us carries, and the question is, do I measure up? Do I have what it takes? Do I belong? And through our life experiences, maybe the families we grow up in or specific experiences, or certain forms of trauma, we incur wounds. 
And these wounds are these things where we might be rejected in a certain way, or we have this instance where maybe I tried to perform, but I didn't quite meet the mark, and then I feel like I've failed. And in those wounded moments, it opens up the possibility for us to try to figure out how to make sense of it. And especially as children, we are so self-centered and egocentric, the world revolves around us that we have to find the answer of what's going wrong. And too often the answer is me. I'm the problem. So I, I have four daughters. A couple of years ago, my second daughter came into the house, into the kitchen. She said, hey, Dad, can I get on your computer? I need to get on and do some, look something up for a homework assignment. I said, yeah, no problem. So she, I gave her my computer. She went downstairs into our living room, and she was sitting with her older sister, and they had the TV on and then the computer on. And my wife said, hey, Tyler, when's the last time we talked to our kids about stuff they're running into online? And I said, oh, it's been quite a while. I mean, I'm a professional. I'm supposed to do this frequently, and yet I haven't talked to my kids in a while about this. So I went downstairs, and we were sitting on the couch. And I had Lexi here and Maddie here, and I sat down right between them. And I just said, hey, guys, can I talk to you about something? And they said, yeah, what's up, Dad? I said, do you guys ever run into anything on the computer that causes you to be curious? or has people doing things that are immodest or that aren't dressed properly. Do um, you ever run into any of that stuff? And my older daughter, Maddie, she's like, yeah, Dad, like I saw this and I saw this and I saw this. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, shame hitting me as a father. I'm, the, I'm supposed to be the professional here too and a father and my daughter's finding this stuff in our home doing homework, right? But then the, the bigger one for me was I look over at my second daughter and she doesn't say a word and she does this. What's going on for her? That's shame. And if I'm worried about addiction, and if I'm worried about relational problems for my daughters as they grow up and get married to people, who am I most worried about in that moment? My second daughter. Because she'd been running into things online that were causing her all sorts of conflicted messages, right? She was feeling excited. She was having, having the physiology turn on because she's a preteen girl and she's changing. And that was exciting and curious. And on the other hand, she was feeling dirty. And she was feeling bad. And she was feeling like it had to be her because how could somebody potentially like something like that? Even though just about every teenager will because that's where they're at and they're, they're growing and developing, right? In that moment, if I don't have that discussion with my daughter and help to normalize her experience and help her see that it's OK that she can talk about these things, she's going to incur a wound that will then feed on new wounds as she goes through life and as she gets rejected in junior high and as she, gets, as she misses out on a dance in high school, every one of those instances will feed that wound and that shame and that's how the template gets set in our brains. In those wounds, we formulate false agreements. We basically make a deal with the devil. And I'll give you a personal example. When I was in high school, I played on the high school basketball team. And my sophomore year, I played on the JV squad, and then I sat on the bench on the varsity squad. My JV year, my, my sophomore year, we got done with the JV game. We're sitting in the varsity bench, and all of my teammates or my friends, they said, what are we going to do after the game tonight? And we talked about what we wanted to do, go to someone's house and play video games or go somewhere else. We had also taken the initiative to put a, a couch up on the school roof. And so a couple of my buddies were like, hey, let's go, up on this, let's go up on the roof tonight and let's just hang out up there. And as they were talking about that, I'm the youngest one of my group of friends, and, and I got this impression that just made me sick. I didn't want to go on the school roof. But I didn't say anything because I didn't want to be left out, and I didn't want to be rejected by my teammates. And so after the game, we went up on the school roof. We hung out up there, had a good time. It was a crystal clear night, beautiful sky. But it was also in February, and on the way down, I was the last one down, and the, my friend right in front of me fell off the roof. And all of my other friends were already on the ground, and they ran away. And I was left to do the first aid on my friend. And then the paramedics came and asked me to walk to my friend's house and tell his parents. So I walked and told his parents, and I went home. And I went to bed that night. I actually had a pretty cool feeling that everything was going to be OK. And I woke up the next morning to the phone ringing to find out that my friend had died. 
Now, for a, a sophomore in high school who's already sensitive to wanting to fit in and have an experience like that, there's a wound now. And that sophomore in high school felt responsible. And because I felt responsible, I felt unworthy. I felt like a failure. I felt like I was a terrible friend. And when I went up to his house the day that he died and knocked on his door and his mom came out and put her arms around me and started to cry, she told me, this is not your fault, but what did I hear? Yeah, you know, this is my fault. I felt responsible. So the agreement now is, Tyler, like you're a terrible friend and you're a failure. And in my case, I felt unworthy. So then I go out into the world and I continue to go through high school and now this is already here. And then I have other experiences. As those experiences build, the agreement stays until I'm all the way into a marriage and my wife doesn't even know I'm carrying this false agreement with me because all she gets to see is the mask of this really cool, good guy because that's what I have to do to make sure people love me. And it's not until five or six years into marriage that the masks all start to come down and she goes, oh my, what did I, who, what did I get into? Right? I think that's why marriages break apart in the first five years of marriage is, is that we don't have an open dialogue about what our wounds are and what agreements we're living with because they seem so automatic, they seem like truth. And then we operate from that place of truth, thinking it's, it has to be true in all of the parts of life. And then we repeat history without even meaning to. And we go and we get ourselves rejected again. Or I go and I fail again, but I see it as me being a failure instead of just being a human being. This affects our self-image, which then erodes us from being able to really truly connect with people. And then we see ourselves as a false thing instead of who we really are. And we start to live from a place of I'm not, instead of knowing who we are. When we're living from shame, we use three screens, like the military use smoke screens. We use shame screens. And so the first shame screen is moving away. This is where we isolate, we withdraw. This is the person who you know has a really embarrassing moment. Like if I really botch this thing today, I'm probably not getting out of bed tomorrow. That's moving away, right? Um, moving towards is pleasing. It's making sure everybody else is happy and no one is ever upset with me because if anyone's ever upset with me, it actually means that I'm not enough. And so I'm just going to be busy all the time caring for everybody else but neglecting myself and giving in on my own values. And then moving against is when we feel like we're like a caged animal that we can't get away. We fight. We blame other people. We distract on other things so that people don't see us. And in that process, in any one of these screens, what we want most is connection, and yet these are the prison walls that keep us from letting people in. So, how many of you right now are still feeling a little bit of the heaviness? <laughs> okay, that's like that awkward laugh, right? Like, oh yeah, like... And, but at least there was some honesty there. There were plenty of hands that time, which is good. So, um, okay. All right, how many of you guys feeling the heaviness now? <laughs> you guys just got Rick rolled. <laughs> so, so there is a purpose for showing you that video, by the way. That's our transition point, all right? We're going to start climbing out of the hole now, so you guys can start letting go of that thing you're holding on to for a second. And I love this quote by Pima Shadran. She says, interrupting our own destructive habits and awakening our heart is the work of a lifetime. If we can understand shame as a work in progress, as something that's flowing and moving, and that we're going to learn to be resilient to it, now we get to go cultivate the right heart. And I can tell you from experience and working with people in recovery that when people learn how to shift their hearts, it makes a bigger difference than any behavior they can go do or any belief they can think. It's about the heart. And that's what shame rips out of us, is it tells us to lose heart. And so what we want to do is we want to make sure our heart's intact and that we're cultivating the right kind of a heart.
So we're going to talk about three C's to shame resiliency. The first one is context. And we're going to talk about courage. And we're going to talk about compassion. And inside of each of these, I'm going to try to give you guys a couple of specific kinds of skills that you can add to your toolbox to practice. And some of these skills will feel uncomfortable to you, and that's okay. You don't have to use them. We're also going to end up doing a couple of activities in here today. I'm just going to encourage you right now to fully participate if you can. You don't have to, but fully participate. The people who will fully throw themselves into these exercises are the ones who will get the best benefit. Okay, so the first C is context. When we have these experiences that kind of bring the shame back out of us, it kind of sucks us deep into the pit of darkness, and we look around, and all we can really see is the pit. We're actually continuing to look down, and we're stuck in this thing, and it's like this big kind of, I call it the quagmire. We're stuck in this muddy place that we just can't get out of. And the more that we look at the mud, the more we complain about life, the more we feel bad about ourselves and we continue to stay stuck there. Shame has a tendency of pulling us all the way down into this place of being alone and in the dark. And one of the things that we want to do to be resilient to shame is to notice that when we start to have that experience and when the tunnel starts to close in, that there is actually a different perspective that we can start to look at. And if we can start to pull out, we can see that... We are actually just in one single moment, in one single experience. And then as we start to look at other experiences, even if they have some darkness to them, we can also start to see that in just about any place there is darkness, there is a contrast of light. You can't even really know the light without having the darkness. And I think it was mentioned up with the keynote speaker, I believe this, that that the greatest source of growth and the greatest fuel that we'll ever gain in whatever we decide to pursue as our life passion is usually going to come from a place of darkness first. And as we pull out, we start to see this, and one of the skills that you can practice here is as you pull out and you're looking at your life experiences and you're focused on the darkness, find the light. This comes through gratitude. Gratitude is a great skill because it helps us see perspective and it also keeps to cultivate our heart. Gratitude is the twin sister of humility. And humility is a key element of long-term success and recovery. So I can start to look for things that I'm grateful for. In my situation with my friend in high school, it's taken several years. There were a few years of darkness to the point of suicide and depression in high school. But in the process, there was also plenty of supportive people. There were a whole bunch of mental health professionals. I, I can't, my eyes are bad. What, what was that time? 20? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, but there's, there were a lot of threads of light, even in my experience, that as I started to climb out of the darkness, I could see. And part of the reason I do what I do for a living is actually a result of that experience. I just didn't know it at the time. So I can actually be grateful in a weird way, even though I hope it would never happen again, and I wish it didn't. I can be grateful for what I've gleaned from that experience. As we continue to drill out, these moments then start to form a picture, but we still don't fully see what it's supposed to be yet. We just know that all of these experiences have some type of meaning, and now we know that there's some light there too that we can go and search for and find. One of the ways that we start to help clear the picture is is we do something called checking the facts. So I can't tell you how many people have been in my office and they come in and they're like, oh man, I don't know anybody else who struggles with this problem. Like I am the biggest dirtbag in the world. Like I can't believe I do this. Maybe it's a pornography addiction. As we start to check the facts, what do we find? We find that 70% of men are looking at pornographic sites at least once a month. We find that the pornography industry is over $100 billion a year. And my client doesn't even spend money on porn. So what does that mean? As we drill out, we realize I'm not alone. Like This is actually a really common problem that a lot of people are struggling with. And it doesn't have to be about pornography. It could be about infertility. It could be about depression or anxiety or any other problem that's common for anyone in this world. 
right? And as we start to check the facts and we start to see the picture for what it actually is instead of what our shame is telling us it is, things become more clear. This is an image that was taken with Chase in, at Dead Horse Point. This was taken at a time in Chase's life where he was going through some big changes in his life. We went to watch the sunrise together. This is the image we took. And part of what happened in his process at this time was that he was climbing out of a hole of a very personal nature where he had just lost a marriage. And he was now moving into a new phase of life where he was finding and he was just starting to date and be with his current wife. And for him, he was able to start to see this bigger picture. And that now he had some experience and there was some meaning in what he had gone through. And that's the last skill here for finding context is find meaning. When we find meaning in the darkness, it takes us from being a victim of our circumstance to being a thriver. It allows us to actually go and use that darkness as fuel to make the world a better place. And that comes with time and it takes a lot of work and practice, but as we find meaning, shame starts to kind of slough out of our bodies and we don't have to carry it with us anymore. The second one is courage. Brene Brown, I love the way she defines courage. She says, she, she uses the Latin root of the word cur, and the definition of courage is to learn to tell the story of your whole heart. Most of us live in a world where we don't feel safe enough to share our whole heart. And it takes a lot of work in an ongoing way and as part of a process to develop some means to have a safe place to share that story of our whole heart. So the first skill set here, and this is an ongoing thing, is to build a team. Every one of us needs to have a team. And the way that I view a team, team building is, is like this. It's like a funnel, and on the outskirts is basically this. Anyone that we come into contact with that we don't really have an influence with, but we still see them, we might meet some of them, that's the outer part of the funnel. And then even after today, you may meet a few new people and there might be some new acquaintances. I have a few new contacts already. And those might move down into now a light acquaintance that's going to turn into a familiar acquaintance, like someone you'd see at church or at school or at work, turns into some friends. And then even inside your friendships, the funnel has to drop to one level deeper, which is what I call the inner circle. And the inner circle is going to be maybe a few select people who I know I can take my ugliness to, and they're going to support it. And they're going to support me, and they're going to help me try to figure out how to climb back out of the hole. So when you build a team, you need four parts of a good team member on the inner circle. Okay, the first one is that these people have to be willing to get in the trenches with you and do some learning. Some of you are probably right here being a good team member because you're learning for a, for a family member or a loved one or a friend. They need to be willing to educate themselves so they can speak your language. Number two, they need to <clears throat> be able to keep your confidence. They're not going to go spread your story with other people. You need a safe place because, because your story is sacred, even though it seems dark, it needs to be shared to the right people. So people who have a good, a good way to hold your information. Third, you need people who are going to respect your ability to choose. So they're not going to control your life. They're not going to make you do certain things or do things for you. They're going to let you still make your choices, and they're going to support you in your pathway of growth. And then the fourth is, is they're going to learn how to provide empathy. And empathy is a skill that gets talked about all the time. Most of us think we're actually pretty good at it, and we're actually not very good at it most of the time. Okay, <laughs> So these are the four parts of empathy that Brene Brown outlines, and I think they're really good ones. The first one is perspective taking. If I'm trying to be a really, really good friend, before I try to fix anything, 
I have to first imagine putting myself directly in the shoes of another person and trying to see their situation and their world through their lenses. Second, I need to remove judgment, which means I need to take my labels out of the situation. The person I'm working with, their situation isn't good or bad. It's their situation. They shouldn't or should do this, this, or this. No, that's not my judgment to make. I'm simply there to start offering my presence. Number three is I need to connect to the emotion that I think the person is sharing with me. And this is where it's, it becomes a really valuable skill to have empathy because if I'm working with somebody who, say, struggles with infertility, I've never actually experienced that before. But I still can be a good therapist and a good support and a good friend if I can start to learn to connect to what it's like to go through that, which leads to what? Confusion, anger, doubt, sometimes blame within a marriage. Have I experienced all of that before? Absolutely. So I may not be able to speak about infertility, but I can definitely connect to those feelings. And if I'm being a good friend, I have to be able to tolerate my own darkness just enough to let it touch me so that I can then step into that same room with the other person. Not make it about me, but let me connect to what they're feeling. And then the last one is to speak it, and I put that in quotes. Because I think too often, speaking it gets in the way. Our verbal usually goes right over the top of what's actually really necessary most of the time with empathy. How many of you guys have heard of mirror neurons before? Quite a few. So. Just over 20 years ago, the, some Italian researchers found this mirror neuron. What the mirror neuron was, is they found it in monkeys, is that a monkey's certain part of their brain will light up when they go and they grab something. And then they were watching a monkey sitting and watching another monkey go and pick something up. And the sitting monkey had the exact same brain response as the one picking up the, the item. And so they they've, they've kind of became fascinating. And what they've found in the research since then is that we as human beings are actually built to connect with people without ever having to say a word. We have these mirror neurons that allow us to get in touch with what other people are experiencing. And so we're going to do a quick exercise on this right now. Okay? So find a partner. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully it's a stranger. It'll work better. But if not, just go with somebody you know. Okay? You're not even, you're, you do not even actually have to speak with each other or tell your whole story, but you're still going to work on this, okay? So the way it's going to work is you're going to take turns. So the first turn, one person is going to be the feeler, and the feeler is going to have about a minute to simply just think about a situation in your life. It could be positive, negative, it could be several different situations. You might change topics. You're not going to say a word. You're just going to think about that situation. The observer is going to have a minute to uncomfortably watch the feeler. <laughs> OK? <laughs> and, then, and, then, and so there'll be music. And when the music stops, then you'll have a minute for the observer to speak what they think they saw. And then the feeler can confirm whether or not they got the emotions right. And then we're going to switch roles and do it for another minute, and then another minute of discussion. Does that sound OK? All right, so you guys all partnered up. Sometimes it helps if you kind of sit side by side this way instead of face on, but that's all right, okay? So during the time the music is running, it needs to be silent, okay? So as soon as the music starts, there needs to be silence.
Okay, observers, speak what you think you saw. Okay, we're going to go back now. You're going to switch places with your partner in terms of whose role you're playing. Okay, so back to silence while the music is on. And if you were the feeler, now you get to observe, okay? Here we go. Observers, speak what you saw. Okay. So really quickly, really quickly, by show of hands, how many of you had the person observing you get your emotion right? Look at that. How did they do that? Empathy was already there. You didn't have to say anything because you were able to just sit and observe and pay attention. And I think that's where we go wrong is we're so self-absorbed sometimes in our own shame that we forget to look up and pay attention to other people. And other people are looking for us just to see them. And that's all empathy is, is just seeing somebody. Being able to hold the space that they're in with them. Okay, the last C. We're going to move on this a little bit quickly. I taught this self-compassion skill that we're going to do first. I taught this two years ago. So I'm going to skip through it pretty quickly. And you can go back and watch the 2017 presentation to get this one, okay? So the, second, the third C is compassion. We need to learn to operate from a sense of knowing who we are as people and treating ourselves with kindness and compassion instead of with criticism. And so self-compassion works with three parts. The first one is mindfulness. I need to know what I'm going through. That means I'm going to connect, connect my head to my heart, to the situation around me, and then I'm going to give it an emotional name. And once I have the name, I'm just going to acknowledge that that's what I'm feeling. Then I'm going to move into the second part, which is called common humanity. And this is where I'm going to remind myself that what I'm going through is human. This is part of the human experience and condition. I'm not alone. I'm not crazy. This is just part of what I'm going through. And then the third part, which we're going to spend a tiny bit more time on today, is self-compassion. I need to learn to talk to myself like I talk to my best friends. I'm going to develop a script in my head that allows me to be compassionate to myself first. So all of you guys have heard of affirmations, I'm sure. You think of that old Saturday Night Live skit, you know, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me, right? People think this skill is cheesy, and I'm going to make it so cheesy today for you guys that, that you, you'll just have to go try it, okay? Because if you do it, and you do it for a consistent amount of time, it's going to work, okay? So the way affirmations work is think of that first statement you had earlier on today when you were feeling all heavy, and just say that statement in your head, I am basically blank. I'm a failure. Okay, that's mine. And now you're going to find a challenge statement. So my challenge statement might be, I'm actually just a work in progress. Or it's human to fail once in a while. This is how I learn and grow. Or today, I'll allow myself room for failure. If you can't come up with a statement of I am, come up with a statement of may I. May I see myself as a work in progress. 
may I give myself permission to act with kindness towards myself. Okay? And then what you're going to do is you're going to start planting the seed. Okay? So this is what I have here. You guys can't see it. But at the front and the back, I'm, I'm holding a bean. Okay? This bean right now is a dry, hard piece of, of something that just really kind of just sits around and does nothing. But affirmations are like seeds, and if you plant them in the soil and you give them what they need, the nutrients and the warmth and the light, eventually they sprout. Not only do they sprout, they grow into what they were built to be, which is a bean plant, which produces several other beans. We're no different than that, you guys. We need to start cultivating the soil, and so here's the challenge for you, is to take a bean on the way out, and put it in your sock. And you're at least going to give it the warmth and the moisture it needs. <laughs> and, and every time you feel that bean and you realize that it's uncomfortable, you're going to think about your affirmation and you're going to say it in your head. So you're going to start flipping the script through the use of a tiny little bean. Okay? There's an artist, famous, his most famous painting was something called The Roses. He actually never printed it for sale. It was his own personal artwork. And when he was asked why he didn't want to sell it, he said he wanted to keep it for himself, and this was the quote that he gave. And I think this is a really good quote for us to start thinking about how we treat ourselves. Hang on the walls of your mind the memory of your successes. Hang on these pictures on the walls of your mind and look at them as you travel through the roadway of life. Take an inventory of the hallways of your own mind. And I would imagine that most of us need a pretty good remodel. So hang some new pictures, find some successes. You've done hard things before. You've been through challenges, you're human, you're resilient. Put some new artwork on the walls and start to go into those places and give yourself credit for who you are. The world tells us I'm not. Advertising tells you you're not. It's built to make you feel bad about yourself so you spend money on their product, right? Our life experiences are built to tell us we're not because we already have those doubts. And the people who are successful in life and in recovery, they learn to operate right here in their hearts from a place of I am. They learn to take back the measuring stick of understanding who they are. And the measuring stick works from the inside out. And I'm just going to close with this thought. It's a poem by Dale Wimbro called The Man in the Glass, because I think this is who needs to have the measuring stick. It says, when you get what you want in your struggle for self, and the world makes you king for a day, then go to the mirror and look at yourself and see what that man has to say. For it isn't your father or mother or wife whose judgment upon you must pass. The fellow whose verdict counts most in your life is the one staring back from the glass. He's the fellow to please. Never mind all the rest. For he's with you clear to the end. And you've passed your most dangerous, difficult test if the man in the glass is your friend. You may fool the whole world through the pathway of years, getting pats on the back as you pass. But your final reward will be a heartache and tears if you've cheated the man in the glass. My prayer for all of us here is to stop cheating the man in the glass. Go build a team. Treat yourself with kindness. And see your life with a bigger picture. And I promise you, you'll have a, a wholehearted, happy life. Thank you.